everyone. Uh, this is the second segment of uh, Physical Geology, the shoreline. Um, and I was on the Longshore Current, and I haven't said uh, this part. Like uh, the wave impact, if the coastline is irregular, the, the wave impact will be a little bit in different uh, because of the refraction. The headland will be more attacked than the bay area. Uh, so the erosion of the headland is very, very important. You will have a lot of erosion at the headland and there will be sedimentation in the bay area. And that actually will, uh, on the long term, straighten the shoreline. So I didn't mention this, so just remember this part. Uh, how fast this uh, longshore current is moving? It's about 0.25 to 1 meter per second. A meter is about 3 feet, so it's about 1 to 3 feet more or less. Um, it can be faster than this, and it can be powerful enough to carry sediment, like on the east coast, um, all the way from Maine to Virginia Beach, down all the way to um, North Carolina. Um, the width of the longshore current I already mentioned is equal with the surf zone. And now, probably the most important part, just uh, we just got to the one of the most important part, the rip current. One of the reasons that I always teach the shoreline chap, not it's just really one of the reasons, uh, is the rip current because this is known by swimmers as undertow. And it's a very, very dangerous thing. People, um, if I ask my students in the class that what are you afraid of when you go to the beach, they say the sharks. But in real life, really what is the most danger on the beach is the rip current, the undertow. Uh, this basically nothing but, a, but channeled backwash coming in a, in a very narrow, straight channel from the shore toward the ocean and it moves really really fast and um, it's really really dangerous because it's full of sediment and when somebody gets into it the water pulls you down and all your orifices are full of sediment and you panic and you have no idea what to do so it's very easy that somebody gets drowned in these things um, so the most common uh, presence of, of rip currents if you have a uh, if on the on the beach there is a lot of sediment and and the water and the sediment comes back really really fast basically uh, digging a channel for itself so it gets worse and worse as time goes on uh, now how can you see where is a rip current rip currents had lots of lots of sediment in them so they usually if you're standing on the beach and you look at the water, if there is a rip current, that will look a bit darker because of the uh, amount of sediment in it. There could be another sign, such as uh, the, the breakers. The breakers are going to be a bit, a bit further out than other parts of the beach. So it's really, really, really important that you realize where the rip currents are. And most importantly, you, you know, you can put it in, my, in your brain that if it ever happens to me that I'm going to get pulled down and uh, get everything full of sand, do not panic. Try not to. So you think, hey, oh, I'm in a rip current, but no problem. I took geology, so I know what to do. What do you have to do? Don't let the current take you out. It's not good. Definitely don't try to struggle against it. The, the safest way to do it is if this here is the rip current, that's the beach. And I will have another slide in just one second about it. So what you do is um, if this is the longshore current, what you're trying to do is uh, that you're trying to figure out that you have to get out of this way. So you want to swim parallel with the shoreline in the way of the longshore current. Because if you try to go against the long sh longshore current, that it will just right take you back. So that's not a good idea. The best way to, to get out of the rip current 
is that you remember because before you came into the water, you check which way was the, was the uh, long shot current, so it's in your brain. So you're gonna go out toward the long shot current because if you go the other way, then the long shot current takes you right back to the rip current, and you do not want to do that. So important, remember. Do not fight against the current. You have to swim parallel with the shoreline in the direction of the long shot current. But I have another slide here which shows you the anatomy of the rip current. Oh, before that, it just tells you that rip currents are really the most dangerous thing around the shoreline. So that's the only thing which really basically makes you drown. So you really should know about it. And here's the anatomy. I have a lot of wine here. It's really late, like it's 11.44, but I want to do this anyways. So, I'm getting ready to go to sleep in a minute. So we have the feeder area, and it actually um, will play when you play the slideshow. And then this is the neck area right here, and that's the head area. That's how the water goes back. So the break... Uh, wave breaker is going to be out here this is always going to be like a uh, darker color so if you are a little bit lucky you can kind of tell that that's a rip current and i have a picture here where you can kind of see this here is the rip current right here and a close-up of it right here so you can see it really messes up the breakers uh, in the area of the rip current if you happen to fly over the shoreline, you can see that very many times there's a whole lot of rip currents around, like here, here, you can see that they are darker. Now, where rip currents are, it's not like a permanent thing, it depends on the waves, the, the wind direction, a lot of different things, so you can never say, oh, there is a rip current right there, it can always be changing at any time, and at any waves. So, now we just finished this part of the lecture and we are now at the tides. And the tides, as you know, everybody knows, is twice a daily rise and fall of the surface of the ocean and large lakes. And actually, you can even measure it in rocks. In Hungary, I used to work in, in a, a water, like a water science department. And um, I was interning in a small area in Hungary where there was a lot of natural caves. And in the caves, we actually had very, very um, fine measurements of the movement, daily movement of the rocks. And you can measure that even the rocks moving a little bit. Of course, it's almost impossible to measure. So you have to have very precise measurements. So everything is moving. And uh, one of the reasons for it is because of the gravitational pull of the moon. So here is that. So one of the reasons that we have the tide is the gravitational pull, pull of the moon and the sun. And the other reason, which most of you probably haven't heard, is the force produced by the rotation of the Earth-Moon system. So these two are very important. And actually, I have a drawing right here. And you can kind of see that... Uh, as we have the the gravitational force of the moon and of course the sun too there will be a bulge on one side of the earth right here is the bulge and on the other side there will be another bar, bulge because of the centrifugal force right here so therefore you have two bulge on earth and imagine the Earth rotating in between these two bulges. So that's why we have two high tides and two low, low tides most of the time on every place of the Earth. Uh, now, when you have two high tide and two low tide, uh, we call it semi-diurnal. And when you have restricted water basins, such as the Gulf of Mexico, possible that there is only one tide, high tide, and one low tide, and we call that diurnal. And then there are places such as the Pacific Ocean, and you have just um, 
mixed tidal pattern because the time between the two high tides is not, not always the same. It's changing. We call that mixed tidal pattern. Now the tidal interval is also important and the tidal interval is the time between two high tides. And then the tidal range is the elevation difference between the sea level uh, at low and high tide. So if this is the sea, and let's say this is low tide, and I say L tide, L T, which is low tide, and this is high tide, H T, then this here is the tidal range right there. Okay, so that's a tidal range. Average tidal range on the Pacific coast is um, one point five to three meter. Around Florida, it's 0.7. And if we go and want to know where is the highest, it's in the Bay of Fundy, Canada. Uh, it's about 45 feet, 15 meter. It's pretty crazy. It's very high. Now, the tide is not just like too high tide, too low tide, and it's always the same. No, there are differences. And uh, we have the so-called spring tide and the neap tide. And the Spring tide is, is higher than average tide. Uh, and the reason for that is because in that case, the sun and the moon are completely lined up. So you say they, they enhance each other. And it happens at new moon and full moon. So those are the two things. On the other hand, the, the neap tide... The neap tide happens when the sun and the, earth, the moon are 90 degrees away from each other. So this will happen in last quarter and first quarter. And in this case, the neap tide means that the high tide is lower than normal. So now imagine from day one, like in the month cycle, moon cycle, the, the tide at new moon is really, really high. And then it gets lower, 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 lower uh, until it reaches the the uh, nip tide at the first quarter, and then it gets higher and higher and higher and higher and higher until it reaches the the highest high tide at the full moon, uh, and then the the uh, yeah. So the last quarter, of course, is lower than normal. So imagine that Earth is moving in between the higher than normal, the spring tide, and the nip tide. Uh, intervals and this is just another explanation showing the the spring tide when the moon earth and the the um, sun lines up and the neap tide when they are 90 degrees away from each other okay so what happened because of the sea level rising as you know even now there are times when during spring tide if you go to Key West you're going to have water on the streets, which is crazy. And of course, this is very typical in, in Italy, like ex especially in Venice, because Venice, as you know, is below almost below the sea level. So whenever it is an extreme high spring tide happens, then uh, St. Mark's Square is going to be flooded with water. So this is a very, very big problem in, in, in a lot of seaside cities. As the sea level is rising during spring tides, they have a lot of problems. Especially when a hurricane is coming during spring tide, you are spring tide. You understand the tide is already higher than normal, and then you got that huge wave, the hurricane wave. So it makes much, much more damage than if it was normal or during nip tide. Now, this was the vertical movement along the shoreline, but let's look at the horizontal movement, and we have to talk about the incoming and outgoing tide. The incoming tide, when the water is moving in, we call it flood tide. And then the outgoing tide, this is what we call ebb tide. That's when the tide is going away. So you get more, more surface to walk on. And this, this is just showing a bunch of ripple marks which were made during this time. Now, very interestingly, I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but like right when the tide is changing, there is one minute, nothing is moving. You know, the water stops, the wind. It's just very interesting. So if you haven't experienced it, just stay once, like right at that time on the beach. 
But during this time, usually much smaller sediment is able to settle down. And if you go back in time and you look at some of these sequences which form on the beach, you can study them actually and it's called tidalite. Tidalite. And it's really interesting because you can go back in time and you can see um, the changes in, in the moon and, and uh, spring tide, mid tide, and very interesting studies could be made. Now, how fast is the tidal current? It really actually about 4.6 miles per hour at the Golden Gate. It could be faster. It, the fastest is 11 miles an hour, so you understand it's really, really fast. And out in France, there is actually a, a, a electric power plant or on a tidal, you know, like in a bay where the tidal range is really big and the current speed is really fast. So they put a um, power plant which is able to produce electricity. Now, I guess I'm going to finish the second segment right here. And I'm going to continue with the third segment from the process which shaped the shoreline.